Thank you, Mr. Forget. Uh, recently, we um, uh, worked with some consultants um, who did a literacy analysis K to six. Uh, they visited each school, uh, observed many, many teachers, interviewed uh, a wide range of teachers and administrators, uh, and wrote a report that the curriculum committee went through uh, in great detail. Uh, and one that we are using to base the next directions that we're moving in um, on that report. What they basically found was that in our district regarding literacy, K-6 to at least, we need a deeper understanding of literacy, teaching, and learning. What it really means to be literate and to teach a, the wide range of, um, of literacy um, using more strategies than were observed. Um, they also found that students to reach higher levels of literacy need to be more proactively engaged in the classroom. Uh, they need to, to not just receive and respond to reading, but they need to seek out um, literacy experiences and opportunities, and they didn't find, they found very little evidence of that. They also found that the district needs a coherent elementary literacy framework. Um, when they asked uh, teachers and administrators to describe the framework of literacy, they got many different answers. Um, so we have to look at what we're doing well in literacy, pull that together, in a way that can frame expectations uh, for teaching and learning and also expectations for parents. They also found, finally, uh, a lack of quality reading material. We have, um, there's an abundance of reading material from the reading series, but if we want to broaden what teaching and learning of literacy really means in the elementary schools, we have to increase the, uh, the, the quantity and the quality of our reading material. They did some, find some shining stars, though, uh, and they were especially impressed with the bilingual classes um, where they saw the teachers, uh, the students very actively engaged and the teachers using a lot of differentiated instructional strategies. We also conducted a math review. Um, this was through an organization called CASDA, and this looked at math from K to 8. Um, and just four quick findings from this math review uh, they found that math teaching tended to be very algorithmic rather than conceptual. So students could perform basic functions in math, but they didn't have a deep understanding of what math was. Um, and to some degrees, the teachers were not, uh, they didn't have the techniques to teach more than, more conceptual uh, types of instruction in math. Um, also, we need to find a way in math to make more real-world application, not just do math for math's sake, but connect it somehow to what the students, especially the older students, but what students experience and find outside of the classroom, where math can have real meaning and not just be um, uh, numbers and worksheets. They, also, uh, they found that we need a stronger, more robust assessment system. Uh, especially in the early years, that the students, the expectations are not clear and the assessments that we're giving them don't give us enough information on what their abilities are in math. And finally, the math curriculum, and this is not just for our district, but this is a lot of districts um, across the state, our math curriculum can be characterized as being a mile wide and an inch deep. We try to cover a lot of ground each year but what ends up happening is that the teachers feel, they find that they do not have the time where they can pull back, go deeper, without sacrificing something. Um, our curricula maps are aligned to the state, um, so this might be, one of the problems is the state might be demanding a curriculum that's a mile wide and an inch deep. We also um, looked at secondary programs, um, and Similar to what the other uh, audits found, the um, people that looked at the secondary programs found a, a low level of active student engagement. They found a lot of receptive types of learning. Um, 
and in very traditional modes where the teacher speaks and one student at a time would, um, would respond. They also um, recommended to us that we form um, a, ver a coherent short-term and long-term professional development plan um, to address the needs of, that they were finding regarding instruction um, and content. They also found um, our programs to be relatively inconsistent. We have some stellar teachers and some teachers that could, on the other end of the spectrum, could really benefit from uh, interacting with these stellar teachers. So they recommended to us that we find a way to get these teachers to become, uh, to collaborate more and share the practices that, um, that they do best. And finally, um, the professional development plan we have just finishing now writing a uh, three-year professional development plan that we'll be presenting to the board shortly. Uh, and there are three main goals in this plan. The first one is to provide teachers and administrators a deeper knowledge of the content that is being taught. Um, yes, uh, a deeper knowledge of instructional strategies, but also to really understand very, very well what, it is, what the content itself is, what is math, and what is literacy, and what is real science education. Second is to help teachers implement the kinds of strategies that research has shown are best for the different content areas. And finally, the third goal is to strengthen the uh, professional community um, and the uh, channels of communication from schools to the district, from and between schools themselves, and also within the schools. So some of those best practices can be shared. Uh, and Mr. Swanson, I think, will give us some information on the special education review. Thank you. Before I start, I, although I've only been in Newburgh for seven months, I have been special educator for 32 years. And um, as a special educator, we are as concerned about student achievement, attendance rates, graduation rates, dropout rates as anyone else. But we have an added layer, and that is a sense of inclusiveness, a sense of belonging, in trying to build systems that do not exclude kids, but include them. That being said, when we arrived, when I arrived, my team and I examined the PRISM report, which was a report conducted by the district last year. We also did a listening tour. We went to all of our schools. We listened to administrators. We listened to teachers. And parents with disabilities provided input as well. We established three goals. First was triage. We had a lot of students in programs receiving services that, that, that did not match their individualized education programs. We had to correct that, and we had to correct that quickly. The next was establishing a sense of order. Procedural manuals, protocols, policies had not, up and date, had not been updated in many years. And our third uh, point, or our third goal, was to really look at the continuum of service in each school. Were we providing the appropriate resources, the appropriate programs for kids with disabilities? Did we need to redeploy? Did we need to redesign? Were we creating programs and plugging kids in, or were we really creating programs based on student need? And then the fourth goal we had was really provided us to, by the state. We were cited once again for the disproportionate suspension and expulsion of kids with disabilities in specific ethnic groups. So if you were a child with a disability, you were more likely to be suspended more frequently and for longer periods of time. If you were a student with a disability of color, the data was even worse. So the state said, you need to develop a comprehensive action plan to correct this issue. Looking at the four goals, I'm happy to say that our triage goal was met, that we either adjusted IEPs or we adjusted programs to meet IEPs so that students were served. When we looked at law and order, we have established a comprehensive procedural manual. Uh, we have been meeting with uh, principals and extended CSE chairs to make sure that we had some consistency across schools and across the district. And when we looked at the continuum of service, 
a te my team would meet with each building principal and their team to redeploy services that made sense. And that goal had three sub-goals. We wanted to expand the number of integrated co-teaching models. That is a model where there's a special educator and a general educator working hand in hand to make sure that quality content is delivered and delivered to the needs of students. We also wanted to make sure that in our self-contained classes, where we either have 12 or 15 students, that we reduce the number of grade levels being served. Typically, in a self-contained class in Newburgh, you would have kids who are in three grade levels. And if we're looking at three grade levels, and we're looking at four content areas, that means a teacher would actually have to do 12 preparations a day. That's an impossibility. So we wanted to, as we reduce the number of self-contained classes, we also want to reduce the number of grade levels within them. And the third was to be flexible enough and nimble enough as a school staff to provide what kids need so that if a kid needs, a kid's needs expanded or something occurred, that child would not have to leave the building to get service. We could maintain the school of choice. We made tremendous progress. We're still not there yet. With, and with regard to indicator 4B, which is the disproportionate uh, suspension and expulsion of kids with disabilities, we've been working hand in hand with NYU, Orange Ulster Boses, and the Prison Group. And we have developed a comprehensive multi-year plan of training to correct that situation. Looking ahead, we will need to continue each and every one of those goals, but we are adding three goals to our plate. First, we are looking at our kids in out-of-district placements. When we, we have 200 plus students who are either attending a BOCI uh, program or a private day program. We question whether those students are actually getting the education that they, that they need. And could we not provide a better education with our own district? The second goal is to look at the compliance around timelines. In special education, we have very stringent timelines between a time when a child is referred, a child is evaluated, and an eligibility meeting is um, conducted. Currently, we've only met that compliance number 9%. We need to do something about that. And lastly, I'm going to forget what that last one was now. <laughs> um, oh, I, they do now. We've spent much of our time this year looking at the structure of special education, the rules, the regulations, our policies, our protocols. Next year, we will turn our focus on what's going on in those special education environments. What is the quality of teaching? How can we, with the help of Dr. Shanahan and Ed Forget, get the instructional coaches to model best practices for teachers, for not only our general education students, but our students with disabilities as well. So moving forward, we're happy to provide updates at any time. Um, and I did neglect to revisit a point. There is a direct correlation between student achievement and the further a student is from the general education class. In other words, the more we pull a kid out of a general education class to provide services or programs, the worse that student achieves. That is a flip from the original thinking back in the day, 1975, when we first passed the special education laws in the state. That's a flip of the thinking. We thought, give them to us, we'll fix them. Students with disabilities need to be able to access the general education curriculum, need to be able to access quality content, and teachers, special educators, also need to be included and those professional development opportunities where they are going to be strengthened with content as well.